Hey everyone, how are we doing? Let's go to Roy Peace first. Peace, how are you doing today? Uh, doing well, trying to rest up from a long day of volunteering yesterday. So just hanging out now, <laughs> hanging out with you guys. <laughs> awesome. Uh, Is there any org you want to plug that you're volunteering with? Um, should, so yeah, yesterday, yeah, we were. Or... Mm-hmm. Yeah, yesterday we were out with uh, the Del Valley Community Coalition again, uh, giving out uh, water, food, uh, PPE. And then um, after that, I went uh, with my other group, uh, Austin Atheist, helping the homeless. And we bagged a bunch of mm-hmm. uh, Back a bunch of like food and supplies for the homeless. Uh, they'll be delivering, those folks will be delivering it today. So we do that once a month. So it happened to be like a double header yesterday. <laughs> yeah. uh-huh. Awesome. How about you, Susie? How are you doing today? I'm okay. <clears throat> um, I'm so glad that you did double yesterday because that means that I can relax. <laughs> <laughs> Got you covered. <laughs> Yeah, no, nothing's been going on here. Just, uh, I, I actually thought for a minute I was sick the other day, but it was just a low fever and I'm fine now. So either that or I got a COVID like that. <laughs> <laughs> ah, good to hear. Dr. Roy War, how are you? <laughs> uh, yeah, so my thing is, I had I had been experimenting with raising plants that aren't native to Texas, but are like Mexico or they're from mm. South Texas, because the stuff that's from the Austin area was starting to get, I think, hammered too much by the drought that we've been experiencing. Um, mm. So, you know, from 2000, 2015 we, or 13, somewhere in there, we had a really nasty drought and then it went away a little bit, but it came back last year. Um and now I'm discovering that those Southern Texas and Mexican plants ain't going to make it. <laughs> wow, that's crazy. Well, that five or three degrees, however far it finally dipped, uh, wiped out a bunch of that stuff. Yeah. So, so what I need now is plants that can survive three to 115 degrees. <laughs> and I'm so... <laughs> Climate change will hit the gardeners first. Yes, right? yeah. apparently. And so the the type of plants that will grow here now has shrunk. Mm. <laughs> I, hear you, I hear you, man. I hear you. I hear you. We're going to have, have a discussion on that. Yeah, yeah absolutely. I, I actually am really interested in that. Like, yeah. I love plants. Well, so one of the things was the Monterey oak, right? Because the, the Monterey oak basically was growing like weeds in my yard. Like I was having to ask questions like which do i pull these up what do i do Mm. and now i think they're dead (laughs) i think they're just wiped out so that answers your question placement for the native stuff but they're no what do you call it solarizing it was like a a a winterizing instead of a solarizing situation just killed everything it just killed everything Everything. start over yeah that's like my ghost plants. I started with like five little plants and then, you know, just pull the seeds off and it, it gets more and more and more and more. But I have them around this one area in my yard and they're all just burned. I'm like, oh no. And that's like the first, that's like the first plant I really started with was those. And that just kind of sprung off to do a ton of other things. And yeah, <laughs> it's kind of sad. I'm uh-huh. sorry. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I, Dr. Banefsha, hey. how are we doing? I'm doing good. I slept almost 10 hours last night. That was awesome. <laughs> I know. We have a deadline for um, something that we're turning in. I was thinking, I'm going to wake up at 5 a.m. I'm going to do this. I was like, nah. <laughs> <laughs> it felt so good. And then I woke up to two two pieces of news one of them was super super happy there's this um political prisoner um she uh was um she was she she has dual citizenship iranian and uk citizenship nazanin zaghari i think her husband's name is ratcliffe um, anyway, she had gone to Iran about five years ago, um, doing uh, just uh, community work and possibly research. I'm not quite clear exactly what she was doing. 
And the regime kind of took her and um, she's been under house arrest for most of that time um, with an ankle bracelet confined to a house. She and her family, her children, her husband are back in the UK. Mm-hmm. And today um, news got out or was it just last night, whenever that was, that she, the ankle bracelets have been taken off but then and that Mm. she's free but that they are she is having a new um i think she's going back to court again uh either this sunday or today or the next day anyway and uh i just hope she can get the hell out somehow (laughs) somehow i don't know how um anyway so that's some kind of movement so that made me happy. Um, and then I just, uh, the other piece of news that I read was um, that in San Antonio, I don't know this person, but a member of the Muslim community in San Antonio, um, a pulmonary specialist um, and a, a doctor um, passed away after fighting since August. Um, he was a frontline um, COVID worker and just 61 years old. Um, Mm. And he, and he is just basically like uh, day and night working. Um, And he lost the battle, which made me think of some data that I'd like, like to share. First of all, one third of all MDs in the U S this was news that I heard like two, three days ago on NPR. One third of all MDs in the U S are, immigrant black and brown folks wow oh, versus how much percent of the population is this immigrant black and brown um folks. i don't know what percentage it's of probably about is. eight or so maybe, yeah, some, maybe a little bit more yeah mm. um that's insane that's cr- it is. that's crazy <laughs> and we're doing awesome. everything we can to discourage that i mean we were i don't know now we're you know like bringing we were we were trying when trump was president he was trying to shut that down Absolutely. like any immigration and it's like but but they stay well and here they- let, here's the other thing <laughs> a couple one other piece of data was that muslims are around one percent of the population but they are what was the other number 15 15 percent of the mds that's oh. another that's a crazy ass number right there yeah yeah, yeah. and all yeah. the rednecks so are going in. i remember i remember when the muslim <laughs> ban came out there was this meme going around saying some baba is saying well you're taking away my job <laughs> and the comeback was yeah, Baba, you're going to be that next brain surgeon or something. <laughs> I remember those. <laughs> yeah, they took that Speak with a white doctor. spot away from you. <laughs> That's fucking fantastic. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. Where were you? You didn't eat. No, no, you're dead on with yeah. that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, one of the ways in which we keep this sort of population of people who are ready, trained, and able to immigrate, immigrate over and do our high skilled labor is through destabilizing these countries, right, over, over the course of decades. Um, yeah, so let, let's talk a little bit more about that today. How has yeah. the CIA, other, other arms of, of this government that we you know, live in, pay taxes to contribute towards all of this, this society of ours, how do we contribute to these destabilizations? across the globe i love that segue Roy. Roy war yeah, take take us fun. to the very war nice <laughs> <laughs> so i mean the thing that immediately comes to mind too is for those of you who think maybe this is past um biden has already announced that he thinks that juan guaido is the legitimate president of venezuela um and of, of course the united states is still interfering in, in haiti's affairs mm-hmm. um so, you know, there was an attempted coup last month, but interestingly enough, the attempted coup in Haiti was against the pro-US, the US-backed president of Haiti, um, and he survived the coup. Um, so there's this, we have a really intense history of overthrows. The way we've done them has shifted. It's intense history of imperialism. Imperialism. <laughs> um, 
Well, actually, that, that begs a, another question, which we should also address real quick. The U.S. Do, does imperialism differently than uh, European states did imperialism. So, you know, Great Britain would go in, they would plant the flag on the ground, and then that, that country would go, wait a minute, what's that? And then Great Britain would go, oh, we just won. Uh, and, then, and then that country would go, wait a minute, you mean if we had taken a flag and planted it in your soil, we'd own you? And then Brits would be like, yeah, yeah, you're slow, and that's how we took you over. And then, do we just go and plant a McDonald's instead? Is that so? How we so work? basically, uh, we put uh, golden arches on, and that's how that's why we own you now. Basically, basically. And so we own all of Europe. Then. You know, yeah. This oh, yeah. this is why this is why like every and every the few Gulf years, States. when when uh, there would be protests, anti-American sentiment or whatever in Pakistan, um, they'd go to the KFC to protest there. That's hilarious. And from, you know, an American perspective, it wouldn't make sense, but from there, right, that is the symbol. That is where you go. That That's the, 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 the more so than the embassy, it's the KFC. <laughs> that's awesome. right. But that's exactly right, right? Because it's all business driven. I mean, corporate, corporate, I corporate. Kid, <laughs> when I was a kid, there was um, all of a sudden, Rafs, uh, anyway, I don't want to get into the politics, but there was this guy called Raf Sanjani. He passed recently, the last four, five, five, six years. I don't even know. Um, and he was super, super powerful. There, there was this rumor that he was going to set up a McDonald's in Tehran. We never figured out if this was real or not. But, <laughs> but around seven or eight o'clock, we, everybody in Te- all the kids, all the high school kids, we were like, we're going there. They said, we all marched there. There was, I cannot tell you how many thousands of people were there and whatever, whether wow. true or not, we shut the idea down. We shut the idea down. <laughs> nice. You know, awesome. they, they March on McDonald's. <laughs> yeah. March on the imaginary it. McDonald's. <laughs> imaginary i love that nice. they showed up I, I remember when i was living in paris and they opened the one on the champs Elysees, and i was just devastated and i found out that in florence they actually the city of florence sold property to mcdonald and the citizens didn't know and they are they were protesting and all kinds of stuff and guess what mcdonald's is now in the plaza santa croce so you could just go there, look at the David, look at Dante, and grab a Big Mac. It's it's like the domain deal that was done here in Austin by Mayor Will. Yes. Yeah, where he, he made a backroom deal in a smoke-filled room with all these corporations. Mm. I will create a tax-free zone for you. And when Austin voters found out, we actually put a proposition on the ballot to revoke the tax-free yeah. zone. And it lost by like 30 votes, something like that. Oh, wow. In part, probably because of the phrasing, because you needed to vote yes. Of to get rid of yes, the I remember and, that. Oh, yeah. And yeah. I think a lot of people. did that on there. purpose. And then, you know, and then Will Wynn and all his, his corrupt um, developer friends put up billboards everywhere that was keep Austin honest. And it was like, I didn't make that deal. You did. Yep. Mm-hmm. Austin dishonest. That's let's right. let's keep an eye out for what happens with this new uh hotel that they've put up and Uh-oh, just handed here it comes. Here it comes. <laughs> fucking jimmy flanagan <laughs> they call that man bankrupt uh what do they call him the bankrupt bully because he's such an asshole <laughs> i'm done <laughs> So on another note, every every Hajj season, Hajj is the <coughs> excuse me, the pilgrimage that <coughs> Muslims are um obliged to take if they can, if they have the means to, um, at least once in their lives, and it's to Mecca. So it's the Kaaba where you know there's all that history. <clears throat> So every Hajj season, there's this meme, there's new versions of this meme that come out where, um, you know, it's, it's the, basically, it's the Kaaba, which is a um, enshrouded black sort of uh, cube, right? <clears throat> and it, it, it's purported to have been initially built by Abraham and all of that. Anyway, it's got this very long history, um, this uh, Abrahamic history. <coughs> Excuse me. And at the same time, you see um, 
this insane buildup uh, uh, like of buildings and skyscrapers and there is literally a mall, a mall with a Starbucks and McDonald's and Zara's and you name it all every possible <laughs> American corporation American corporate uh, well multinational or American yeah, corporate yeah. that you yeah. can that you can think of and it just the soullessness of this this what is supposed to be a spiritual pilgrimage journey and the ties that that this how it's been sullied by capitalism and and things um yes so american presence absolutely roy war what is the like archetypical case of of the cia going in and intervening in a country actually before what we does do that, that look like how does it happen well before we do that I, what i want to do is i want to i, I want to sort of lay the foundation for why the united states does imperialism differently um <laughs> So, so how, who does it normally? So the, the way the French or the British or the Germans, for that matter, the Italians did it was they would, they would go in and they would conquer and they would take over the land and they would rule it directly. So, um, for example, in 1882, the British invaded Egypt. Now, they left the monarchy in place. In fact, they, they, they made the, <laughs> the Khadawi uh, change his title to king so that he would, it would sound mm. like it fit more into the European model. So that, so that, in effect, the King of England becomes then the emperor of the British Empire, and then the King of Egypt is subordinate to him. Um, or you would just outright take over the place. and then, Or some combination, like with India, some places were outright annexed yeah. to the British Empire, and some places were still ruled by local authorities, but they were still under British rule. Like, you know, so it's, there was, but nonetheless, there are soldiers on the ground permanently, there's a permanent military base. There's, there's just a permanent presence with the, with the flag flying. What happened was uh, the United States, I, I think, because it felt like it, it would play catch up, right? There was no way to really get in because the British had already carved a huge chunk of Africa up. Um, the, you know, the British already had a big chunk of Asia. The French had a big chunk of Asia. Like, where would you go? So I think what the United States decided and and also 19th century united states didn't have the military might to really pull off mm-hmm. too much the united states decided to take a very different approach which was invade the country sure overthrow its government and then pull out leaving the puppet government behind and then then you're not only not wasting money on a permanent military presence but as long as that puppet government survives you're basically getting whatever you wanted for free Right, because that puppet government knows it survives only because it continues to allow your businesses to operate and plunder the place. And we we did this to Latin America on a massive scale. Um, we invaded Honduras set eight times, Nicaragua seven times. Every time they would get in a leader that would change the price of bananas, we'd go in there and and shoot the place up. And of course, that's where we get the term banana republic from. Right, that's an, that, that that was a uniquely U.S. construct construct with china we created the open door policy and the idea was that european states would not and and japan would not carve china up into little spheres but rather all of china would be open to all businesses and so it would become sort of a free market enterprise <laughs> not truly free obviously but we we like to pretend and then that way you know the us could trade anywhere There wouldn't be these zones. And that actually became more or less the dominant model in China. And I, and, and so, and it was more or less successful. I mean, the United States and and the European powers invaded China multiple times. Um, You know, we'd send gunboats up rivers and shoot, shoot various places up just to make sure we got our business policies in place. Obviously there's the opium wars, right? The boxer rebellion, lots of, lots of military intervention, but it became sort of the dominant system that the United States took around the world. World War II happens, we need to pretend we're the good guys. So we need to shift policy. And it's not that we're never going to send the Marines into a place to shoot it up. It's that we become more reluctant to send in the Marines and shoot up a place. (laughs) 
So we, you know, we do Guatemala in 54, we do Lebanon in 58. It's not that we're not sending in the Marines anymore. And obviously we do Vietnam and Iraq. It's just, uh, if we can, we'd rather use the CIA to do it. And so that's, that's why... Uh, the CIA plays the major role that it does beginning um, with its creation in 47. 47. Okay. All right. So, so how, how does it get started and, and why is 47 the year? What else was going on uh, at this time period? So the U S prior to the CIA had a thing called the OSS and the OSS was created specifically just for world war II. It, it existed <laughs> complete, almost completely within the framework of the time period of, that the U S was involved in world war II. Um, and, you know, the Office of Strategic, I, I just, I forgot what it stands for. Uh, the, the whole idea was, it was our intelligence agency. Service. Service, service. is that what it was? Okay. So. Um, Strategic services, yeah. Yeah. And the whole idea was, we would, we would go in there and we could do some spying. Um, some of it was aerial. Like, for example, they would, we'd send airplanes over and we would photograph stuff. And then the OSS would figure out what it was based on what they knew for their operatives on the ground. And the idea was that when we did invasions, airborne drops, whatever we we're doing, we would know who to contact to get support from the locals. Um, mm. I, as a general rule, it was a pretty benign organization as far as war goes. Um, and we ended it with the end of World War II. In, in the 40s, in the late 40s, uh, some business leaders some Yale graduates, which is just a, such a weird, a weird, weirdly specific group of people, and former members of the OSS uh, created the CIA, and then basically went to the federal government and said, "Look, we have an organization. <laughs> mm-hmm. the, the, what's at stake here is do do you want to have a say in what we do? And if you do, you you need to fund us. And if you don't, we'll just go rogue and do our own thing and serve." serve our business whoever pays us what whoever was pay, serve whoever pays us Basically. i mean it sounds like they would have either sold us out to another country if they could have or work for us i mean that seems to be the differentiation i'm getting here well, and to gonna... be clear they never worked for us the cia <laughs> never served the united states what it serves is businesses so the number one thing the CIA does and has done throughout its entire existence is not actually overthrowing governments. It's actually been corporate espionage. Yeah. Yeah. What, what the CIA has primarily done is it steals secrets from French companies and British companies and German companies and brings them to the United States um, and then hands it over to U.S. companies. But then. So, okay. So was what, the that was, was that Hoover who started it? Or Truman, who was that who, who actually started? Well, Truman was the president at the time, yes. Okay. Um, and, and, and he's he's the first president to use the CIA in this nefarious way. What did um, he do? In many ways, what, what happened in 1949 in Syria is sort of the CIA's test case. Uh, Miles Copeland, the musician, was a CIA operative. Uh by his own account, he was an Arabophile. He actually really uh, uh, loved Arab mm. culture, and um, his friend Kermit Roosevelt, an Orientalist. Uh, I have no idea. Okay, is that really what, what it's called? Arabophile? No, uh, Ramesh, you said Ori- Orientalist. <laughs> oh, he he was pr- totally an Orientalist. There's no doubt. So an Orientalist. Yeah. Uh, Actually, Ramesh, why don't you define? <laughs> yeah, please do. I, I'm very, I'm very uh, curious. Yeah, so there's there. It, it, it's one thing to like love the 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 Arab world or an Eastern culture, uh, Eastern with proximity to to, to Europe, uh, in in an authentic kind of way where you're immersed in it, where you understand it, its contours, its contradictions, all that good stuff. Uh, it's another thing to like project an image onto it. Uh, this image uh, maybe of like. Uh, harems and luxury and uh all, all, all this beautiful stuff um and to have yeah th- this uh, a fetishized image of this culture that doesn't actually exist in real life but exists sort of in in your mind in this temporally uh weird space as well right um neither in the 12th century nor in the 19th century doesn't look any different history doesn't happen here yeah all sorts of strangeness 
Okay. Yeah. So d- was he actually an Arabophile or was he an Orientalist? Uh, and the probably. answer is yes. Yeah. <laughs> For sure. <laughs> um, so it, it, it also has a bunch of nostalgia with it, which is, mm. um, yeah, this is the old ways of being and we miss it. It has no place in modern life anymore, but oh, it reminds of, of us of the girl. yeah. men can have many wives they can keep them, you know, sequestered. They can, you know, children yeah. are in their place. Uh, it's not that uh, different here, I don't think. You know, slavery. Okay, where have we, where have we heard this before? Just recently, yeah. make America <laughs> great again. <laughs> yeah, so lots of nostalgia, and you know, uh-huh. it's it, there is justification to go in there, have these sort of warm feelings towards these peoples and their ways of being, but also, you know, it's okay to exploit them. Because at the same time, they must catch up and we are fatherly paternal towards them and we want the, to, to teach them the new ways. That's our exactly way. what we are. We are paternal. Mm. If we were maternal, it so might, whenever everything you see, would be different. Whenever you see a, a white or European person with, with good, kindly intentions towards Arab folks or whatever, think about Orientalism. That should go off in your head. Yes, <laughs> yes for sure. I, and w- one of the consequences of this uh romanticized thing of the past has been like the romanticization of the bedouin that the bedouin are the ultimate arabs that they you know they live in the desert they're they're not corrupted by by the city life by urban life and uh you know like if you read uh john bagat Glabasha's uh books on the arabs it's clear he's it, He's he's totally enraptured with this this notion of the pure Arab being the Bedouin, um, as opposed to the thinker, the scientist, the philosopher, the person who created the first this and that. No, <laughs> no, yeah. yeah, the horse riding living in the desert by there. That's the real thing. That that's the so that's horse the riding for people thing. who know anything about Arabs, but most people are going to invoke camels Camel, I'm because sorry, they don't camels. know anything about Arabs. I'm sorry. <laughs> And then they're going to invoke the wrong camel and they're going to put two hump camels out there and it's going to drive me bonkers. <laughs> Did you, do you remember when George Bush said something about his mm-hmm. missiles that could hit a camel in the <laughs> ass? From yeah. I was like, what <laughs> is like that? that? Yeah. Why would you say that? It makes no sense. Uh, who's the guy who wrote the, the, the Arab hater, the historian? Oh, yes. Uh, I know. There's an Arab hater who's a historian. Are you oh, kidding? God. Almost He's... all historians no, are Arab in haters. Fact, in fact, he was, he <laughs> was the number one scholar um, that the, uh, the Republicans, at least pre-Trump era, would go to. I can't to. think of his name. Arg. Anyway, so I'm gonna look. Is this our like civilizational uh, yes. conflict, dude? Yes. Oh my god, it's on this. Huntington? Uh, no, no. no. Huntington. Is Borka, guy. is it? Uh, <laughs> we're talking about the English guy. Hold I can't on. remember now. He's English, or he's actually yeah, he he's talks... a British guy. But um, yeah, he became the. He is the cornerstone of the work of people like Huntington and all that. Right. Okay, so I'm the, gonna look. I'm gonna keep. Okay. I'm just gonna keep going because I don't want to waste time. So. Um, he he writes saura, which is the word for revolution. He he goes saura to which literally means to rise up, as in a camel rising up. Why are you invoking the imagery of a camel when you're talking about revolution? That's Bernard Lewis. That's y'all. it. That's ah, Bernard Lewis. I like the way you leaned in, like I did with Jimmy Flanagan. <laughs> <laughs> going to slowly find everyone's little trigger points you people yeah. here <laughs> i think roy woody has one <laughs> no trigger points he's good with everything <laughs> except maybe the 1400 dollars. so yeah so- <laughs> the point of bernard lewis don't say it susie is- Except the fourteen hundred dollars, it's true. Uh, uh, fourteen hundred instead of fourteen hundred dollars. <laughs> it's two thousand. It is. You already got six hundred. <laughs> no, <laughs> they ran on two thousand. Not what yeah. they said. They did, and they kept saying, "And you've already got six hundred. <laughs> no, they didn't. No, they didn't. But let's move on. <laughs> So we were talking tell me, about- tell me back. 
Camels are rising. Oh, I see. I see hookah lamps in the, in the background. Use of language. <clears throat> We've talked about this before. How language is used in particular ways to, um, to to make the stuff you want to say between the lines pop out. <laughs> and and you know you're talking about revolution. You're talking about the one of the ultimate ways in which people can express themselves politically. And so you. you you're talking about the Arabic word for it. So you need to invoke camels. Like it's complete non sequitur, but, but that's it. That's what you're going to do. Dehumanizing, right? This is, this is camel standing in for an entire like population for people, for communities, for societies, for histories, all of this. A camel is taking that place. And, and you know, the majority of people in the Middle East don't live in the desert. They live in a, 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 a chunk of land that's totally arable. Hence, the large population, right? The, the and, Arab- and the and the the extensive, many folded civilization pieces of the the Islamic world civilizations in the Islamic world. Big long rivers. Big long no, but like <laughs> this, the, the focus is the is is the point, right? The focus. so it's not people in a tent somewhere, is it, it, right? It, 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 I- the I think what you're when, when I hear camel on civilization is on the lack of civilization. It is mm-hmm. focused on how civilization began and ended with white folks, <laughs> as opposed to all the majority of everyone else. And and the myth that it started with Greece and that Greece was by itself isolated from all the folks around it who were barbarians <clears throat> who were barbarians <laughs> and, and and white apparently greeks were all white which but they weren't but by the way they weren't <laughs> no they weren't and even in the 19th Nobody century europeans were still like, not sure that greeks were white <laughs> yeah it's, but it's the myth making right yeah so, so much so that when greeks came here uh, people were like wait a minute these people are like italians and they're yes. they're they're they're, they're white n-words and what's going on and like you know (laughs) yeah yeah there's a lot of you know there's a lot of um manipulation of information and Mm. and building the imaginary that goes on i don't think we would have crawled out of that primordial soup in that area (laughs) if it were not sustainable i mean (laughs) Right. And the, the CIA, <laughs> back to the CIA, they, they engage in this myth making as well, right? They're very invested in, in the kinds of stories we tell. They, they fund our major Hollywood productions uh, every year to the tune of tens of millions of dollars, actually. Very strange. They used like the this. CIA. Why are they? Yeah. They used, uh, I mean, the, the CIA used Hollywood for a lot of stuff, I think. It, well, don't, you know, you put that in past tense. It's, it's continuous. It's, it's happening today. It'll happen a year from now, two years from now as well. Uh, didn't the cia i didn't i read this recently the cia has actually played a major role in promoting the marvel movies yes i heard something like that that. yes yeah you're right Mm -hmm. um and and right because have this international world we we went on air that uh the cia got involved in academia and promoting uh, michel (laughs) foucault yes do you want to talk more about that yeah so there was this this point in in like intellectual history right where you had uh you know thinkers on both the right and the left you had this political environment where where uh you know communism was was a big global threat to to this country to the business interests the cia represented all this good stuff and you needed to have have some place for these damn leftist academics in in their universities teaching these radical ideas to their kids or whatever the hell uh, to, 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 to think about and to have a position on the left that was not a communist or a Marxist position. Uh, and so, you know, you, you, you find this cool, radical French thinker and prop him up a little bit more uh, than, than the other folks. You make this an acceptable leftist position to hold and to have. And so you had the CIA who was, you know, actively involved in, in changing the conversation around this intellectual tradition, which, which isn't a drag on, on Foucault. We still... Of Foucault and all this stuff and he's still useful but it's very interesting that they're inserting themselves into the cultural conversation at, at both this like intellectual level at the pop level when it comes to Hollywood as well uh in addition to doing like direct uh action uh, and intervention in countries internationally well that's one wow. good thing the CIA did because <laughs> I gotta say Foucault is fabulous yeah <laughs> he is fabulous. I, I, I love Foucault but I was very shocked to, to learn about yeah, yeah. Well, they screwed up there. I gotta tell you. Oh, 
<laughs> so one of the things that's worth pointing out is the CIA itself is also in has drunk the Kool-Aid. Like they believe the myth they're promoting. It's not just simply like yeah. there's these cynical guys who are like, what myth can we create? So for example, mm-hmm. Miles Copeland, the guy who does the 1949 overthrow of the Syrian uh, government. For, for, for the record, Syria uh, came out of World War II as a democracy. It, it, it left the French empire um, as a democracy. It had a free and fair election. al Qatli was elected to be uh, its first leader. And we decide two years later, we don't like him. We don't want him there. I actually kind of think... Uh, Truman probably didn't actually care. It was it was more like let's do a test run on a state we don't care about that won't have particularly dangerous implications. And so they the Miles Copeland does this overthrow, and he's successful. Syria ends up in disaster land. So the, you know you're a brand new fledgling democracy. You've been at it for two years, and your government goes down in, in a CIA coup. What ends up happening is over the course of the next um, eight, nine years. Yeah, over the course of the next nine years, Syria ends up with like 10 or 11 different heads of state (laughs) because it's just having coup after coup after coup. And so no government can last 12 months and it collapses and there's a new government. And finally, Al-Qawatli himself comes back. He becomes uh, the the leader (laughs) a, a second time. And he, he ends up going to Gamal Abdel Nasser, the president of Egypt, and says, look, we're done. Syria's finished. What's going to happen is the communists are going to take over. We know you're anti-communist. What we propose is we merge and you, you become the president of Syria. And so Egypt and Syria in 1958 merge to try to recover from the 1949 uh, coup. And so, you know, it turns out there is this very severe consequence when these things happen. Um, Patrice Lumumba in, in Democratic Republic of Congo, we we uh, murder him and we replace him with a guy uh, named Mobutu Sesseko, who ends up being the tyrant, cruel, sadistic leader of re- newly renamed Democratic Republic of Congo, becomes Zaire. And, you know, it's 30 years of <laughs> underdeveloping Zaire. Instead of Zaire, become, Zaire is one of the most mineral wealthy countries on the planet. And instead of it yeah. so, so becoming wealthy, it became poor. Why is it that? Yeah, yeah. Why? Why is it that? You know, you have this like, like. Tell me more about the 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 global context taking place here, right? You have this series of like newly independent states who are freed from uh, direct uh, colonization, freed from direct imperialism, and are starting to articulate their own sovereignty in a particular kind of way. They're starting to have control over their own resources. Uh, have state companies replace the other companies that were extracting resources from their their territories or land or whatever, and then use them towards build, building an actual uh, state in the third world. Um, why is is this why the CIA really wanted to intervene here? Was there, yeah, what else was going on? The CIA ran into a really interesting situation. So Tru- Truman's whole doctrine was: we need to fight communism no matter what, everywhere we can. Eisenhower came along and he said, no, our real goal is to disassemble the British and French empires and then replace them. We, we need to destroy our, our, our allies. So we're going to look them in the face while we're shaking their hand and stabbing a knife into their gut. <laughs> um, and then we need to replace those empires. So as states like Syria and and Democratic Republic of Congo break away from their old imperial masters, we need to become the new masters, but in the American style, we're going to send multinational corporations and then plunder and loot the place. The problem was, and this is the irony of all of this, after World War II, Europe goes socialist, right? They create the welfare state. I mean, it's socialist capitalist hybrid. I think people get confused there, but just, just so we're clear, the, the public had a fair amount of socialism, um, you know, in, including some states issuing a, a check every month to everybody so that you could have just a basic living income. Um, so our allies in this, Western Europe, Western and Central Europe, Italy and Germany and the Netherlands, are themselves experimenting with the socialism that we've decided is evil. And honestly... The United States was never really threatened by communism because the idea of communism spreading across the world was pretty preposterous. If you, in retrospect, mm-hmm. right, I have no doubt that the actors at the time believed it would spread. 
more than it ended up doing. Mm-hmm. But, but, but in retrospect, when we look back, we realize communism just wasn't the big threat. The real threat the United States was facing was this European style socialist capitalist hybrid system. And so on the one hand, our allies are doing exactly the worst thing imaginable for us, but we're, we're destroying them and tearing apart their empires and trying to replace them. And those, those former colonies are inspired by the European states that they, that they've broken away from and want to Im- imitate that model. People like Patrice Lumumba and Gamal Abdel Nasser want to do this sort of, um, <clears throat> they want to do this sort of European style socialist capitalist hybrid system. So we need to nip that in the butt because we can't allow people like Patrice Lumumba and Gamal Abdel Nasser to, to, Wait a minute. to, are they actually, to succeed. Are they saying that they want to imitate Europe? They're definitely not saying they want to imitate Europe, but they all have that, that, well, there's obviously exceptions like Gossam in, in Iraq uh, was a, was an outright communist. Um, he, he gained power in 58 and then we, we overthrew him in a coup in 63. I guess um, my question is how much are they actually moved by, um, you know, communist states and what they're doing as opposed to what Europe is doing? Oh, definitely. So like, for for example, Gamal Abdel Nasser hated <laughs> communism and, he, and that's one of the reasons why he annexes Syria in 58 is he's trying to prevent that. He wanted to do what Central Europe and Western Europe was doing. But the yeah. problem was, is if that spread and was successful, like, you know, Nehru was doing the same thing in India. Yeah. Um, if, if, you, if you pull this off mm-hmm. across the third world, it would have meant a massive amount of state regulation on U.S. businesses trying to plunder mm-hmm. and loot and pillage. And we couldn't allow that. We needed to make sure that these states were compliant with, <laughs> with, the, with the new empire that we were creating to replace the British Empire which was one of corporate plundering. Mm-hmm. And, and if you look, the states that we, we try to destroy, right? Iran, Venezuela, Cuba, North Korea, those are the states <laughs> that have completely rejected and refused to enter into the, the system that the United States wants. Mm-hmm. The states that yeah. we With- have, have all joined. They're all on board. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. With a lot of like sort of soft power and penalties for those that are not on, on board with this international world order, right? Like right. You, you have all these other rules like sanctions and and uh, refusal of like IMF participation. Uh, things where right, you have all these giant tools that that look like they're independent uh, objective bodies like the IMF, like the World right. Bank. Uh, uh, th- that sound mysterious, right? It's not like I vote for the director of the IMF or I vote for the director of the World Bank. There, there's, it's not a democratic institution that's operating here on this global level, but it still has this outsized kind of influence on how these uh, countries are able to operate in the scope of, of the sovereignty that they have. Yeah, so you, you bring up a really good point. There's basically the United States has used three tools to sort of promote this empire. One is the soft tools that you're talking about here where, you know, if you, if you play, we'll reward you. And if you don't play, we'll, we'll sanction you. Mm-hmm. We'll, mm-hmm. we won't give you loans. That's right. Um, on, another thing is war. Uh, the United States has made it very clear that if you step out of line, you, you could get bombed. Like for example, Iraq is the first state on earth to stop using petrodollars, right? And switched over to the Euro to, to do oil transactions. And then the n- very next year, because they did it in 2002, the very next year, we're invading Iraq. I mean, we made it very clear, we will, we will not let you, if we can stop you anyway, from switching over to the Euro. The Russians have switched over to the Euro and we didn't do anything about it. Iran and Venezuela switched over to the Euro. Um, mm. Didn't know that. And, 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 but, but the problem with war is as a general rule, war is awful for the economy. The Vietnam War tore up the U.S. economy. The, U- the U.S. Eco- like, there's this mm-hmm. stupid myth that Americans with two-digit IQs run around saying, which is war is good for economies. Oh, my God, dude, there's one war in human history that that was true for. Every, all the other wars have been the exact opposite. They've been catastrophic. World War II is the only war you can point to and go, wow, that was really good for the economy. For but- the U.S. economy. Well, Okay. I mean, that's not all that matters, obviously, yes. Yeah, but 65 million people died. So there was a little bit of a price tag for that, not really, that great economy. Yeah, not really. <laughs> um, so <laughs> it, any, the third tool was the CIA. 
You, mm -hmm. we will try to overthrow your, your government. And I have a number. We have attempted 66 coup d'etats since 1947, and we have succeeded <laughs> 26 times. How, how many countries are there? How many sovereign nations are I there? I think the UN says there's 196 states. Oh, I was going to say 152, mm. but yeah, okay. So yeah. about a third, almost a third. We've attempted, we basically, attempted a, a, we've attempted a third, but, but, but some, several times for yeah, sure. some states get it multiple <laughs> times. Um, <laughs> so yeah. it's a yeah. little, Iraq, Iraq is one of them, right? Iraq. <sighs> well, so in the case of Iraq, uh, we definitely participated in the coup in 58, which took out mm -hmm. King Faisal. Um, and then the guy that we helped get into power, a communist, by the way, <laughs> We, we and the Soviets were both getting Gossam into power. We got, once we got him into power, he was in power five years before we did a coup to get rid of him. So, <laughs> and and uh, it was the Ba'athists that we helped get into power mm -hmm. when, when Gossam was killed. It, and amazingly enough, the CIA gave uh, Saddam Hussein a list of, of communists that we didn't want. And Saddam Hussein then basically became an agent of the CIA and, and went around murdering Iraqis that we disliked. And the same thing happened with the CIA and the Shah. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. So tell, oh, wait, give me, mm, should we go to that, that story? Like why, why was the, the embassy a particular type, uh, a particular target? What happened with the middle schoolers? All of this, this good stuff. Mm. Yeah. Are we talking about Iran? Yeah. Yeah. You mean the embassy as far as uh, 1979? It, the revolution itself yeah yeah so right from from an american perspective we see this as uh this terrible atrocity they they attack the embassy they they there it's an attack on american you know values and democracy and freedom and women's liberation and all this whatever the fuck uh in actuality the embassy was this particular site of of, 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 of focus it was the because yeah 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 because of yeah, the, the the base of operations for the CIA operations across the but all it was. of Asia. <laughs> yeah. It was for because all of Asia. There are fi there are uh, there is a fifty four volume compendium of documents they they the, that the CIA operatives were not able to shred or burn before the or, embassy or they was... did shred, but they were put back together. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's right. They yeah. were put back together. Thank yeah. you. Some of them, <laughs> yes, some they were put back together. And this has become a, and this is, you know, you would go to, um, for a while in the late nine, 1990s, I was going to, when I was going to Iran, I was interviewing all these big wigs and invariably in the bookcases behind them, you would see this 50 <laughs> <laughs> volume. <laughs> um, and it was basically all of the communiques with Washington and all the yeah. plans. And sure enough, what I mean, I that's <laughs> that's what it was. They were that's what embassies yeah. do. Like, it's an understood yeah. thing. Like, I don't understand what there, there's no point in mm -hmm. arguing this. I mean, it's an understood thing. Well, th that's what I'm saying. It, it, it's an understood thing for for the proportion of the world that has you know suffered at at the at the at the hands of this particular system that's oh so i don't it's know it's not an understood thing in the united well, states I is it i don't i don't i think it's pretty much well understood that embassies are there for diplomacy but also for gathering information and doing what doing maybe uh, amongst the intellectuals our but country I doubt is this. bidding I was just going to say that. But, but may I add, I, I, I want to add something that if you tell someone who is naive about this, if you actually go to them and say, well, but the United States embassy, just like any other embassy does this, they would, they would be okay with it. They'd be like, oh, well, that's part of, that's part of, uh, you know, the, just, just. I don't think that, excuse me, I don't think there's a lot of Americans who understand that an embassy is actually considered part of that country. You know, like you, you get into America, an American embassy, and people can't, the, nobody can come in and take you out. You are essentially on American soil right. yeah. in that embassy. Right. And so, uh, and so. It, People, I don't think people know what an embassy is, and I really don't. I think there but are a lot of people. But my point is, who even do... if you tell them that part of part of the role of an embassy is, uh, you know, mm -hmm. spying, spying. They, yep. uh, you're you're 
you know, normal American would be like, uh, okay, like, sure. I mean, that's a good thing, even if you, yeah, you, yeah like, at any rate. So, uh, yeah. So, what, what, I, what was specifically your question, Ramesh, about? I, I was just asking if we wanted to go there, and we went there, and, and <laughs> we, cool, went right? there. But we, we went there. We didn't quite go there. So, tell me like, about the middle schoolers. <laughs> You want to Do we want to go way back? 1950? Like, yeah, 19, 1950. Yeah. We, I mean, it's a classic just, example of the CIA yeah. So, overthrow. Yeah, yeah so um, in the early 1950s, um, there was this movement that started um, in the late 40s. Um, and the parliament in Iran was becoming stronger. <clears throat> Parliamentarians were becoming stronger. The democracy movement in Iran was becoming stronger. More and more Iranians were um, going to universities. The university system was growing. Um, Iran was becoming part of this new liberation movement that was taking the third world by storm. And... <clears throat> And the center um, um, all, of all of this was the National Iranian Oil Company, which um, belonged for the most part to British Petroleum. Mm -hmm. Imagine that. So this was the, Iran was uh, directly conquered. Iran was never, well, except for uh, during World War during II, World War II it, uh. was, it was conquered. Um, but then when when the Russians and the English left, uh, the Russians said bye, but the English kind of took over. Um, and, and, mm -hmm. and the way that they took over was through oil. Um, and, you know, one of the ways Roy was talking about um, uh, imperialism, British imperialism, of course, yes, they would come on the ground and then they would sort of uh, build infrastructure and in the Middle East they did this a lot they built infrastructure the oil extraction infrastructure and then they were like okay uh, this means that we're going to own this and we're going to give you 10 percent, but we're going to take 90 um, yeah so that's that was what was going on and then um, up in the ranks there was this up and coming sort of um, de democratic movement star called Mohammed Mossadegh and uh, my uncles were uh, going to school at the same time in college. And pretty much if you were anybody, if you were a youngster in university, you were a supporter of this man. And a national movement started to, to throw the English out and nationalize the Iranian oil. And um, Mossadegh's sort of... Uh, uh, his his rallying cry became sort of because of this de this anti imperialist and and democratic movement cry became we want to nationalize Iranian oil, and he did it. He did it in Parliament, um, and that really freaked the English out. And mm -hmm. it's a long story, but uh, the Americans stepped in, and the way that they this is Mike here. I'm jumping in now. <laughs> yeah. So. Uh, what happened was before Mossadegh nationalized the Anglo-Iranian oil company and made it the National Iranian Oil Company, um, what he did was he threw out the British embassy. Yes. And the reason he did that is because in 1905, 1906, when Iran attempted to go democratic the first time, the British spies in Iran uh, helped overthrow their democracy. They, uh, Russian and, invasion. And may, may I note that at, at each of those two moments and throughout uh Iranian history since the 1800s, um, the kings, um, it used to be a monarchy, um, the kings were all basically bought by, by these imperialist powers, whether they were Russian or they were English at that point. And starting at this point, the Americans. And then, so what happens is uh, the, the British actually come to Harry S. Truman and they go, hey, we need help in Iran because our embassy shut down. So we need you guys to do the overthrow. Mm. And uh, Truman said no. His actual words were, we, we're not in the habit of overthrowing governments. But as I just pointed out in 1949, <laughs> he just did it. So he, I don't know what was going through Truman's mind. Was he a liar, a hypocrite? He forgot. I don't he was he busy. God, he forgot. He forgot. You know, he was tired. He was tired. So, um, what 
what ends up happening is in the 1952 election, the British approach Eisenhower and they go, look, when you, be, when you become president, will you help us? And he's like, yeah, I mean, it's a done deal. I'm going to win this November election. So once I'm in, uh, I will do it. And he, he released Kermit Roosevelt, um, who is, a, there was actually a trio. There was the two Roosevelt brothers and Miles Copeland. And uh, Kermit Roosevelt then goes and he gets members of the Iranian military. So it's 1953 to overthrow most of the- Wait, wait. So it's not, not quite the military. What happens is that he hires a bunch of thugs. No, you're, you're skipping a step. Okay. The thugs come later. That's his set backup plan. He's oh, like, is it? Yeah. So he oh, gets okay. he gets members of the military. They go and they knock on Mossadegh's door at like 3 a.m. And Kermit Roosevelt, who's, by the way, the grandson of the Theodore Roosevelt. So mm, it's just, almost like we're not, not a meritocracy. <laughs> yeah. It's almost like we have nobility with fixed positions and titles that get passed out hereditarily. Um, he's actually over in the bushes watching from a distance. Who is? Uh, Kermit Roosevelt, the CIA operative. Uh-huh. And the, the, the police knock on Mossadegh's door and they go, okay, we're here to arrest you. And he goes, no, I'm arresting you. And all these men jump out of the bushes and arrest the coup leaders because Mossadegh Oh my God, I love it. this story. This is awesome. Mm. Yeah. And now Roosevelt is recalled. Eisenhower goes, nope, I'm calling off the operation. This went sideways. And so Roosevelt decides, no. No, I will never be defeated. This is going to happen. Mm. And so he goes into hiding and he meets with Norman Schwarzkopf Sr. Not the okay. general, but the general's dad. Okay. <laughs> who is and a businessman was- mm. who operated in Iraq and Iran. And he says, hey, what do I need to do? And that's when he comes up with mm. the, it's actually Norman Schwarzkopf Sr.'s idea to use the thugs. Mm. Uh, yeah, so basically they, they hire a bunch of thugs um, and it wasn't very many. It was like some hundreds, you know, like two, three hundred, something like that. And they start and they <laughs> they also get help from the clerics. Um, so they start um, a they basically buy a bunch of idiots um, and start a rally. And that 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 did it. That did it. They, they, what they would do is they would go through the streets breaking things, chanting, we lo- chanting, we love Mossadegh. And then Mossadegh would be like, stop, yeah. if you love me, why are you doing this? And it, and it destabilizes his government. Yeah. The- yeah. It also reminds us of some other thing that <laughs> happened in the U- ha- keeps happening in the U.S. <laughs> yeah. <I do> tell. <laughs> yeah. And so then just to take things in a weird step, so we wanted to get rid of Nasser, the president of Egypt, we, and we just couldn't figure out how to do it. Finally, what we came up with was, why don't we befriend him through the CIA? So Nasser was working with the Russians, but a CIA operative actually went and hooked up with him and became friends. His name was Miles Copeland, as in the uh-huh. guy in the Syria overthrow. And so mm-hmm. Nasser and him actually had this really casual, con- they, would, they would talk about <laughs> operations um miles copeland ends up in an interview i just want to say something there is a reason (laughs) why the third world um and and folks who come to the u.s from the third world don't trust white folks (laughs) people who don't come from other i mean minorities who are born here don't trust white folks Gay people don't trust white folks, even if we're, you know, but yeah, no, and nor should they, quite frankly. I'm just shocked women trust white folks. Like, I don't, <laughs> like, I think women shouldn't second. trust white folks. All right, let's just say it. It's white men. Fine. <laughs> it's white men. A hundred percent. Sorry. I'm done with but it. I'm come on. So white done. women do their bidding. Yeah, I mean, that's, do. that's oh, also. Yeah. They voted trust in. They yeah. did. <laughs> <laughs> they voted for him twice. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, I mean, voted for Trump. <laughs> They'll vote for him yeah. in twenty twenty four too. Yeah, they will. Uh, yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm gearing up. Uh, I'm thinking of buying a rail car and burying it in my backyard because <laughs> I don't think the United States survives another four years of Trump. Uh, uh-uh. no way, no, no way. way. So, four, yeah. Yeah. sounds like the Democrats. I, I want to. 
<laughs> I, I want to do one more thing about Miles Copeland just because he's come up so much. First of all, his son <laughs> was in the band The Police. So I just, I need to... Get the hell out yeah. of here. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> it's so weird. The Police. What? The Police. Get the hell out yeah. of here. <laughs> the Police. I think it's Stuart <laughs> Copeland. Because there's a Miles Copeland Jr. too. I think it was Stuart who was in the Stuart, band. Stuart Copeland, I think, was the son that was in the police. Anyway, so um, Miles Copeland did an interview where he admits that the CIA was running around overthrowing all these governments. I like, feel like this show is about Miles Copeland. Yeah, it really is. <laughs> yeah. And it, the interviewer asks him point blank, Did, didn't you hurt the world by doing this? And Copeland won't say it. He says, no, these things needed to happen. And this is the point that I was making about the CIA has drunk the Kool-Aid. These, these are believers. They are people who really, honest to God, think they're making the world a better place. By believing in the supremacy of the white man's rule yes. and intellect exactly. and all of that. Yeah, yeah. There is this Obviously. national well, the- fascist myth that, that white Americans hold on to, that, that the British who did Brexit hold mm-hmm. on to, that the Hungarians and the Poles who have gone fascist hold on to. It's called white supremacy. That somehow White there is something, uh, and here's my final thing about this. Uh, when the Iraq war was happening in 2003, I had a friend who was a liberal um, who was against the war. The war happened and his immediate response after it had taken place was, okay, I was against the war, but now that it's on, we need to do our best to make Iraq mm. better. And, it, and it's like, oh, there it is. White that's, supremacy. That's happens, yeah. You can't make it better with your 230-year-old no, civilization. But may I just say, there is nothing in, in this regime of white supremacy and in this larger kind of construct, it is impossible for white folks to believe there is anything they can learn from anyone who is not mm-hmm. white. That's right. There is no cultural value. There is no value in any other culture that they can. I think this well, it's because they're it's because they're better ones on camels in the desert, right? That's and right. the camel's not even That's standing right. up. Yet. And it's even if down. they're not, even if they're not, we're gonna make him that way. Uh, we can shoot Western that camel in the ass with a missile. <laughs> yes. Yes. Yeah. It's true, though, and I think that's why this show is particularly important. Honestly. Because it does, it, you know, it's culturally um, when we talk. And I am happy to play the white person because I am the white person. And I, I agree. I'm half that, white. Susie, I got to <laughs> tell you, we, we have all drank that white supremacy Kool-Aid. I yeah. carry it within me. I'm yeah, actually me genetically too. half. <laughs> <laughs> no. Yeah, no. But, I, that's, I, I, but I we can't... all carry that. I am constantly, I am constantly having to counter my own bullshit beliefs. Yep. When that's they right. come up, I'm like, oh, yeah. it's like, like unlearning, yeah. right? And, and that's unlearning. really that's hard. It. You know, when you have a habit where you always put your keys in the same place and then you start. She doesn't pooping. know that, by the way. Okay. But just a regular, <laughs> doesn't know what? just a general habit. Place. You know, it's just a diver- divergent mind. I'm sorry, and it's always working. <laughs> <laughs> it always wants you- to do new thing. New thing. It's organi- organized, organized chaos. chaos. It's organized I'm chaos. divergent. I'm divergent. I can't find my keys. <laughs> yeah, that's but, well, but it's my new thing. I'm like, anybody up. says, why can't you focus? I'm divergent. I'm divergent. I'm divergent. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. I like that. I'm constantly in a limited oh, right. myself. <laughs> That's funny. Whew. Okay. I, I want to zoom back in on, on something, Benefsha, you said earlier to, to sort of wrap us up uh, and take us home. Um, you earlier said that this these these patterns of the thugs being hired and, and going through the streets or whatever else uh, uh, seemed familiar to you or, or, or something like this, right? And I think I want to close out by, by saying that uh, the same sort of pattern and and modes of control and um, propaganda efforts and things like this that we engage in internationally and, and develop and really get a good handle on uh, in, in this international space eventually do come home to roost and to rest, right? Um, and the you know sim- similar tactics of of, of control of of of, uh, of controlling the direction of like political movements things like this or whatever end up happening in this country as well. And hopefully we can do an episode on on that someday as well. 
Well, thank you for saying that, Ramesh. I'm just gonna um, I, I I'm just gonna say that I'm I'm an immigrant, so maybe I don't have a a place saying this, but at least through my studies, um, I've come to notice that everything that the United States as um, sort of tactics, strategies, policies, whatever it's done um, abroad, it perfected here on the indigenous people and then on mm -hmm. the enslaved folks by bringing them over and keeping them in their place. <laughs> um, <laughs> Yeah, if we don't they have haven't. Somebody they have not been course. able to do it. May I just add that, as far as um, as far as the life force, Thank as far as that. the intellectual sort of uh, blood of this country, what we see are um, first black folks that give this person place a soul so they have not succeeded in any freaking way if anything oh look at that look at that baby in the picture. <laughs> uh, but yeah whatever whatever methods they took across the waters they perfected here and that mindset that white supremacist mindset perfected they 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 donned that ooh, they donned whatever <laughs> cloth they had going here and then they took it everywhere else yeah yeah we're like a virus and for the record to... you've been a citizen now for 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 18 years and I think you can, you cannot, you don't have, you, you qualify don't now. Qualify. Yeah. Don't do it's that. Not, you can, you're an you're, American. Just I'm, as much as anybody else. I was pointing to the fact that I am not the person who should be talking about this and perhaps Roy Peace needs to, or sh in, if he wanted to, but I also wanted to say something else. And then I, my divergent brain forgot. I, I think after you learn like <laughs> Cherokee or Ojibwa or Menominee or Potawatomi or something, then we can have a different conversation. But as long as we're talking in English, I think everything's bullshit. <laughs> yeah. All I right. Say, well. I would, yeah. You, you, you are an American. You're, I mean, you're, you know, if you're proud to, to be American, which I am, you know, I am a, I'm a proud American. I I'm just, not, I'm not even a proud human these days. Let me tell you. <laughs> I, you know, I hear you. I think collectively we are bad, but I think there are some of us who are really trying. And again, I do think we're a virus to this, to this earth. I think we're parasites. Oh, this but is what I was going to say. I was going to say something. And what I was going to say is a lot of when, when, when discussions happen around white supremacy, and I'd love to have a conversation about this. A lot of folks take this um, to a DNA. They, 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 their minds go straight to, well, there must be something wrong with white DNA. Is that what you're talking about? And I have to say, um, racialization has happened for black and brown folks, but it has also happened for white folks. Yeah, This is all a construct. And whatever thing I said white folks dawned on, that was a dawning. It was a choice at some point by some folks. And now we have all stepped in that into that shit, literally. Yep. So mm -hmm. um, this and, has and nothing to do with the, the, the virus. Yeah. The makeup of the human system. And it once the Chinese take over, it'll be we'll be talking about <laughs> Chinese supremacy. <laughs> Because they'll just <laughs> impose their system. And yeah. so, and, and my and own personal common. experience is if the Turks and the Persians were in this position. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so it's not a genetic thing. It is just. Yeah. Power. yeah. So the the, the virus like is not yeah. the human, it's the ideology. Yeah, yeah it's like the study they do, right? With, uh, oh, I'm sorry. No, yeah, no. I was going to say, it's like that study they do where they have like, uh, you know the prison guards or whatever and then it's like the people you know it's, it's like the whole like yeah, yeah, yeah you yeah. know people, people with power the is Stanford actually Stanford project or whatever yes. yeah exactly it's like that yeah <laughs> yeah uh -huh. it, it, it is but, but I do have to say I think it has a lot to do with with um a cultural traits too. absolutely um exactly. in the sense that Europeans when they started the whole enslavement of humans as a trade because their cultural, especially their 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 financial system, capitalism, um, 
gave them an an okay about it. Like it, there was a shift. There was a cultural sh- shift in values. Yeah. And I mean that that really didn't happen in other parts of the world. Mm-hmm. Yeah. The, with, Everywhere with... else, uh, communalism was still more important than individualism, and and. That mm-hmm. shift for the Europeans really fucked them up and fucked the rest of us up too. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Humans, humans are not the virus. Mm-mm. It's the ideology of the virus, mm-hmm. and with the Stanford Prison Experiment, it, it was a bunch of white boys who had competed well enough to get into Stanford to, to, to <laughs> yeah. that were there and were put into a position of of, of a prison, a model of a prison. Exactly. Put, It'd like, be interesting if it was a different group of people in there. What would have happened? It, absolutely yeah we recently saw a film what the heck was this film that we uh what was the name of this film anyway it was like this um comet that's hitting the earth oh greenland greenland right oh and for the first time ever i noticed that they were making right realistic choices for who was actually coming to the aid of others and who was being self-centered Wow. For the first time ever, it was folks who believe in communal sort of living and values, which are the black and brown folks for the most part. And the folks who are who are reared to be self-centered and which are the white folks. I mean, this is this is a it's a cultural thing. It has nothing to do with DNA. It is. And also it's worth pointing out, I think, that when you don't have a sense of community, you have to fill that void because community creates rules, rules on how you interact. And you have to fill that void with rules yeah. because mm-hmm. you don't yeah. have the Roy rules. Made a really good, yeah. And so structurally what ends up happening is people who are so individualistic mm. end up being these rigid rules rule, followers, rule who, followers who think, oh my God, no, this is the law. This yeah. is the rule. Yeah. And they have no space for the human exceptions yeah. that pop up along the way. Yeah. And then now we've computerized everything and made it even worse. Yeah. Or it was the white women. The doctor was. Remember that doctor? There was one white woman who broke the rules, and it was a, a mm. woman who did it. Yeah. It always uh, ends. There was a group of. We, we have this. We have this pinata called the white man. <laughs> just keep <laughs> on <of> the <laughs> Well, just like, just like we we have the government we deserve. <laughs> it's true. It's true. That's true. Oh, by the way, before we leave, oh. Ooh. I just want to. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, with with the recognition that there is no better closing note than the ones you just presented, let's let's head out. Wait, oh no, uh, we're, can, we're I, can, I, can I just one thing? Yes. Um, so today begins the uh, it's a week long um, virtual protest that's going on by the Amazon workers uh, at oh. the Bessemer uh, warehouse in Alabama. Uh, they're going to be voting to unionize pretty soon. And, you know, Amazon has a history of union busting. So they're asking folks not to use Amazon's website, Prime, or the Alexa products for the rest of the week uh, until Saturday. And uh, if you want to find more about that, go to ucomblog.com. That's the letter U, C-O-M-M, blog.com. So, cool. Yeah. <laughs> Don't cross that picket line. Don't, Don't cross do that it, picket man. line. Yeah. Do <laughs> These people uh-huh. are peeing in bottles. Don't do it. <clears throat> That's right. They're they're having to work with uh, you know the COVID conditions and yeah. you know what I mean. They're not taking it as serious at Amazon warehouses, so it's pretty something something to stand in solidarity with. Yeah. Yes. Don't be a scab. <laughs> what is this called? Person across the picket line. Really? Is that what the word for it is? That's yeah. what they're called. I didn't know that. Either. I didn't know that. Either. Because <laughs> when the people right. when the so people strike, those... <laughs> they have to they have people who come in and cover it up like yeah. a scab. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. To 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 all of those who are on this side of the picket line, a good week to you. We'll see you next week, next Sunday, all of that. And yeah, take care until Bye then. Yes, yeah, stay happy and healthy. Yay! Okay, I'm assuming Roy just stopped that.